turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. We are going to diverge from our study through Philippians today and do take a look at the heart of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9. We will read the first five verses. Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, these are stunning words of the Apostle Paul. And he wrote them on the sacred pages of Scripture through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he was driven along. Father, we need help to understand these words. We need help to feel what Paul felt And to live how Paul lived. So please come. Send us your spirit. To open our eyes. To behold wondrous things from your word. That what is to be preached now. Would be your very words father. That it would be communicating. What you want to communicate to your people. That I the preacher would get out of the way. That you would speak. And that the words which are communicated. Would bear eternal fruit for good in those who hear them. We ask this desperate, dependent upon you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. What we just read, these five verses at the start of Romans chapter 9, are some of the most remarkable statements in all of Scripture. You know, many of us are probably familiar with Romans chapter 9 insofar as it centers around that age-old debate about the sovereignty of God in salvation. And we absolutely should be. There are profound statements made in Romans chapter 9 about the electing love of God, His sovereignty in choosing whom He will save. I know that many have tried to evade that topic by saying He's speaking of nations and not individual people. But what we will discover today is that most certainly the burden upon the Apostle Paul in writing Romans chapter 9 was that for the salvation of individual people. And I've stated before speaking of the doctrine of election, before getting into debates on Romans chapter 9, we ought to have a very real sense or a very vivid understanding of the spirit in which Paul wrote these truths. If you see in Romans chapter 9, the verses we just read, and the first few verses of Romans chapter 10, you find a man in anguish. You find a man broken in spirit. You find a man who has a heart for the salvation of his kinsmen according to the flesh. You find a man who desires the salvation of the lost. My focus is not going to be on the rest of Romans 9 today or that age-old debate. My focus is going to be to narrow in on these first five verses of the chapter and to discover and to see why Paul was in anguish. What this anguish was caused by. Why was he in anguish? I want us to understand this anguish. I want us as a people to come to feel what the apostle himself felt. 
I want us to come to know what the apostle himself knew. I want us to live and to walk in what we will discover is a Christ-like anguish. A sentiment, feelings, anguish and grief which Paul demonstrated as a reflection of Christ, his Savior. I want us to understand it, and I want us to live with this same anguish. So, we are going to delve in, and we are going to see five things in the spirit of Paul here, in his heart. You'll see on your outline, we're going to see the backdrop to Paul's anguish. We'll see the sincerity of it, the depth of it, the aggravation of Paul's anguish, and finally, the Christ-likeness of Paul's anguish. So consider with me from these striking verses, which upon pondering and reading, you can hardly walk away from meditation, not in tears or in sorrow yourself of what Paul is saying. So, consider with me first the backdrop to Paul's anguish. The Apostle Paul is the one writing these words here in Romans chapter 9. And in order for us to understand what Paul's feeling, we've got to understand something about Paul himself. The Jews hated Paul. For he had defected. Paul himself was a Jew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But he defected one of their greatest advocates and fighters in trying to destroy the followers of the way, this person Jesus, who the Jews considered, considered to be a blasphemer and an imposter, had now turned to following this Jesus and preaching and teaching that he rose from the dead. One of their greatest advocates in seeking to destroy the teaching of Jesus had now converted to the teaching of Jesus. The Jews hated Paul. You don't have to turn there, but listen to Acts chapter 9. Saul, who became Paul, it says in verse 22, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. The exact thing they didn't want to happen. The one who'd been seeking to destroy the teaching of Jesus was now confounding the Jews and proving Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Well, what was their response to this? Verse 23 of Acts 9. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. The Jews hated Paul. Listen to Acts 18, beginning in verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that Christ was the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. You know, what Paul was doing so masterfully was himself converted by Christ, was going back to the Jewish people and showing them, this is indeed your Messiah. You know, Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? Because their Messiah was not going to come like Jesus. A poor man who would, would be crucified like a criminal. No, our Messiah is going to come and politically triumph over the Romans. Our Messiah is going to dwell in mansions. Our Messiah is impressive. This Jesus isn't our Messiah. And Saul believed that. Until he became Paul, and he started proving to them, no, this is the Messiah. They hated him for it. So deep was their hatred for Paul. Listen to Acts 23, beginning in verse 12. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. That's serious hatred, isn't it? Forty people saying, I'm not eating or drinking until we kill this guy. I often wonder if they kept that oath. <laughs> Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Paul's recounting all of the persecutions he's had in ministry. And take note of several of these. 
Five times, he says, I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Verse 26, he says, I was in danger from my own people. The Jews hated Paul. They had loved Saul, but they hated Paul. But that's to be expected, isn't it? Of course they hated him. He was teaching and following the same Christ that they hated and killed. Their hatred of Paul here that I want you to notice is not the remarkable thing. That's expected. We shouldn't be shocked that the Jews hated Paul for following and teaching Christ because they hated Christ and they put him to death. The remarkable thing, which I want you to know, is the depth of Paul's love for them. And what I want us to see today is that this love that we see in Paul was simply a mere reflection of the love of Christ. We see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, these same ones who would put him to death. Oh, Jerusalem, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. He wept over the city because of their hardness, lamenting their unbelief. And it brought tears to his eyes and deep grief to his heart. And so what, we, what I want to show you today is that the Jewish people who hated Christ hated also Paul. But that's not the remarkable thing. The remarkable thing is that the depth of Paul's love for them. And it is, as we will see, a mere reflection of the love Christ had for them. You know, as a point of application here, we could just pause and, and just see in this transformation of Paul's life, how he went from Saul, loved by the Jews, to Paul, hated by the Jews. You know, that's really what happens to the Christian, isn't it? Have you ever been told perhaps you were saved out of a life of, of you know, hanging out with your buddies or hanging out with the girls and doing crazy stuff and living the party scene, living the worldly life, and you got saved? Were you ever told, where's the old you? You know, I want the old you back. What, what happened to that girl that we used to love and hang out with? What happened to that guy? Where are you? Well, this is what happens for the Christian. When they are face to face with the living Christ in the gospel, it divides. It happens when you truly meet Christ as Paul did, as Saul did on the road to Damascus. Your whole world is flipped upside down and you become a new person. You've been gripped by the reality of the living God living inside of you. And your unsaved family members, your wife, your children, your parents, or your friends look on and they have absolutely no comprehension of what has happened to you. And it perplexes them. And they wish it had never happened. They do not understand it. Indeed, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And a deep and profound division is created by the gospel of Christ between the man whose eyes have been opened to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's interesting to look at the life of Paul in this regard. Saul becomes Paul. And a division happens. So fierce is that division that even his own countrymen say we're not going to eat or drink until we kill him. There's hardly a more radical picture, is there, of a man transferring from darkness into light and to see the division it causes. And just as a point of examination or application for you, have you ever thought of this in your life? Are you aware of this new identity you have in Christ? Have you gained a new family? Are you aware of belonging to a new people are you aware of the fact that your real, deepest brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, are Christians, united by the blood of Christ, a deeper bond than even that of the blood of 
family? Or do you sit here still today feeling your closest alignment with those in the world who hate Christ still? Have you experienced the reality that Paul did of going from Saul to Paul? Well, that's a bit of backdrop to Paul's anguish. And we want to, I want to transport you and put you in sh Paul's shoes that you could feel what he felt. You've got to understand, his whole kinsmen, his family, everyone he loves and knows has turned on him with a fierce hatred, a fierce animosity, a fierce passion to kill him because of Christ. And yet Paul only had love for his kinsmen according to the flesh. Consider with me, secondly, the sincerity of Paul's anguish. Look in verse 1 of Romans 9. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says. I am speaking the truth in Christ. What is Paul saying? Well, first, I do believe there's an element of the reality that he's speaking in Christ, meaning he's speaking as one in Christ, a believer united to Jesus Christ. So he's speaking the truth in Christ. But further, I do believe that he is calling Jesus Christ as his witness here. I am speaking the truth. You could say, knowing that Jesus Christ is watching me. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. He's calling to witness Jesus to testify of the truth, of the sincerity of what he's about to express. You know, this isn't an uncommon thing for the Apostle Paul to do. We often hear him charging Timothy in the presence of God and in the presence of Jesus Christ and of the elect angels. Paul would call to witness God and even the angels to testify of what he's saying. And so Paul here, look on in verse 1 there, says, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Look, whatever Paul's about to say, we better perk up. He just said, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. Let me actually bring in the witness of the Holy Spirit to testify. Paul is absolutely desperate to let his reader know the depth of sincerity in making the statement that he's about to make. He is called to witness Christ and now the Spirit. He's essentially saying, my conscience, the aspect of me that convicts me when I'm wrong, is informed and aligned with the God, with God, the Holy Spirit. And I'm calling the Holy Spirit to bear witness that I'm not lying. You know, this is a fearful thing, isn't it, really? You remember Acts 5? What did Ananias and Sapphira do? And Peter said, you have not lied to man, but to God. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They dropped dead. This is a fearful thing for Paul. This is a weighty thing for Paul. To say, I'm telling you the truth. God be my witness. What I'm saying is true. That's the sincerity of Paul's anguish. But he hasn't made his statement yet, so let's go on to examine what is the statement he's going to make, to which he's calling God as his witness. Let's look thirdly at the depth of Paul's anguish. Look there in verse 2. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish in my heart. I want to just break down those words just to give us a, a more full understanding. Great. This is the word megas, from which we get the word mega which means big, right? How would we use that today? I don't even know. A 
mega excited. Is that something? But we use the word mega. It's big. Oh, maybe mega sales. Have you ever seen? Do they have mega sales at closeout? Like mega, this is huge. This is what's known as a Pauline superlative. Paul's often using superlatives, saying, this is big, this is mega, this is huge. And what he's saying here is, I have mega sorrow, huge sorrow, great sorrow. Sorrow is the word lupe. It means sadness, grievous, heaviness, sorrow, exactly how it's translated. Paul is saying, my sorrow is great. It is profound. And isn't this only building upon his sorrow, the unceasing anguish? That's nonstop, continual, consuming grief or pain. Could also be translated, incessant anguish. It's nonstop anguish. Where is he feeling these? It's in his heart. These are Paul's thoughts or feelings. This is tangible. It's the kind of pain and anguish and burden that doesn't go away so quickly. I don't know about you, but when I think of these words, and I know some of you women who are mothers will scoff at me, but when I think of these words, I remember a time when I was sick in the Philippines. We were there in, I think, 2014 or 2015, and the last night, we were a 36-hour drive down to the southern Philippines, and we were leaving. We spent two weeks there. We were going back up north, had to make a 36-hour or 32-hour drive up north on these little turning roads and had to take a, a, a freight across the, the harbor for eight hours in the middle of the night. Not a fun journey to do if you're not feeling well. Well, the morning we were going to leave, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning starting to feel a churning in my stomach. And I thought not much of it, tried to sleep. Well, before you know it, about four, three or four hours later, I had this agony in my stomach that felt like it was twisting and a pain that I'd never felt before which I'm positive is greater than labor pains. <laughs> and as I felt this pain, this anguish, it was incessant. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. And tears are filling my eyes as my body is just trying to, to react to this pain. And I'm sitting there as we start this 30-some hour journey up north thinking, Oh God, please. Please, give me some respite. Give me some peace. And I remember praying this. So great was the anguish. I told the Lord, Lord, just give me five minute break. I wasn't even praying at that point to take it away completely. I said, just give me a break for five minutes. He soon did and through the prayers, I believe, of the saints, uh, the pain quickly went away. But as I think of this unceasing anguish, that was what I felt. It was just nonstop anguish. And I wasn't even praying for it to stop completely. I just wanted a break. Here, Paul is telling us that he is experiencing Bitter grief, great sorrow, incessant, nonstop, unceasing anguish in his heart. There's no words Paul could have used greater to try to get the point across than what we will see here. Look at verse 3. Four. You, you, have you ever felt like words just fall short? Like you're trying to communicate something so profound, so great, and words just, there are no words. Paul's trying to express this unceasing anguish, and so he, seeking to use words, writes in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You know, here in chapter 9 of Romans 9, if you're familiar with chapter 8, 
Paul has just come out of the incredible blessings that are found for those in Christ Jesus. The assurance and the love that nothing can separate you from. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, the Spirit cries out with our spirit, Abba, Father. It gives assurance and and comfort and it draws near all the blessings of being in Christ in Romans chapter 8. And Paul enters Romans chapter 9 and takes all of that in all of the glories of Romans chapter 8, all of it combined and says, for I could wish that I myself would be cut off from these blessings. That all of the blessings of Romans 8 would be taken from me. Anathema. Accursed. For the sake of my kinsmen. According to the flesh. It's a powerful statement. Paul's making. What greater glories are there. Than to be found in Christ. And to have all the spiritual blessings. Of the heavenly places. Given to us in Christ. There's nothing greater. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Paul says, I could wish myself cut off from it all. That word accursed, we know it well, anathema. This this word is used of something or someone devoted completely to God for destruction. Doomed for eternal damnation. You know, an imagery that I like to use is, you know the white, Rooms, imagine a room with no doors, no windows, four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. No way out. And imagine yourself in that room, alone with a mother grizzly bear. One thing's going to happen in that room. Total destruction. This word anathema has the idea behind it of you being in the presence of God with no escape and the only reason you are in the presence of God is to be destroyed. It is a fearfully powerful word. And Paul says, I could wish myself anathema for the sake of my kinsmen. Now, I need to make a qualifying statement. What Paul is not saying is that he does wish himself to be accursed. He's not saying that. He's not saying, I do wish to be cut off. He says, look at the verse, I could wish myself to be accursed. He's essentially saying, if it were possible to be, but it's not, but my burden is so great that if it were possible, I could even wish myself accursed for my kinsmen. I checked different commentators on what they had to say. I found Martin Lloyd-Jones to be very helpful. Listen to Lloyd-Jones' comment on this. What we have here in Romans is a very strong expression of Paul's feelings. He does not actually wish to be accursed from Christ, but he does say, in effect, you know, I am so concerned about this that if someone, somehow or other, by being sacrificed myself, it would help them, but then he leaves it. You cannot go on with that, writes Lloyd-Jones. The wish, the thought, entered my mind. I was on the point of saying, but then he stops. That's insightful from Lloyd-Jones. Paul is not saying, please curse me, God. But he's trying to communicate how great his burden is. And he's saying, of unceasing anguish, of great sorrow, I I could even wish myself accursed. And he stops, Lloyd-Jones says. It's not possible such a thing. Nor is it possible for a child of God to wish such a thing. You know, there's another time in Scripture I want to show you similar to this. I really regard this statement in Romans 9 and the statement I'm about to show you as two of the most profound or striking statements that I've found in my own personal walk through Scripture. If you turn to Exodus 32... You see the same kind of thing being spoken of. This desire from a man of God actually coming to the point where his burden is so great for the lost that he could actually almost wish himself to be destroyed in their place. 
It's a powerful thing. Here we come with a little bit of backdrop to Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. He's taken them to the place where he's actually gone to the mountain and he's received the Ten Commandments. And upon coming down, what does he find the people doing? Does anyone remember? They're worshiping the calf. It says they're having orgies. They're worshiping. They're in pure idolatry. Then Moses in fury throws down the tablets. He goes back up to the mountain. We read this in Exodus 32. The next day, verse 30, I'm sorry, of Exodus 32, verse 30. The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, now look at this. But now, if you will forgive their sin, and then he stops. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. What is he saying? He's saying, God, forgive them. Take me in their place, oh God, forgive them. He's saying, I'll go down with the ship. I'll go with the people. Blot me out of your book that you have written. Moses' willingness to be atonement for the people that they would live. One commentator, John Bengal, it is not easy to estimate the measure of love in a Moses and a Paul. For our limited reason does not grasp it as a child cannot comprehend the courage of warriors. Just trying to think of the sentiment of Paul, the sentiment of Moses, wouldn't you or I perhaps be more prone upon coming down from the, the, the top of the mountain with the, scroll, the, the, the scrolls written on the tablets in your hand and you look upon this wicked people who couldn't wait but 40 days to return to God in disgust and say, yeah, God, destroy them. Destroy them. They've earned it. They deserve it. We'll see in a moment that Paul's situation was similar. It was the Jews who had rejected Jesus. Paul, every right, would have had to say, destroy them, God. But what do we find in the reaction in the hearts of these men? Oh God, don't destroy them. If even I could be in their place somehow, if possible. Words fail us, but we see the depth of Paul's anguish and his love and his desire to see the salvation of his kinsmen. Consider with me, fourthly, the aggravation of Paul's anguish. Look at verse 4. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. What aggravated Paul's anguish? What stirred his anguish? And you could say what aggravated, what stirred the anguish of Moses? It was this, the Israelites had such privilege. To them had been given the special revelation of God himself. He had chosen them. Out of all the people, this little band of Israelites, the God of the universe revealed himself to them. 
of all the people who existed, who should be bowing down to, worshiping, praising, following, and serving the Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ? The Jews. They should be ones, the ones taking this glorious gospel to the ends of the earth. But no, they rejected it. They've covered their ears. They've gnashed their teeth. They killed Jesus and they're seeking to kill his disciples. Look what he says there. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promise. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race the Christ has come. Jesus is of their blood. Of all people, they should embrace him. Put yourself in the shoes of Moses descending down that mountain. Of all people who should be faithful to the God of Israel, shouldn't it be the Israelites? After all, he'd miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. After all, he miraculously sustained them multiple times with water from rocks, bread from heaven. After all, he miraculously saved them from their enemies. He would parted the, the Red Sea for them. Of all people who could wait but 40 days, it would be the Israelites, wouldn't it? The ones of privilege. Wouldn't that exacerbate? Wouldn't that heighten? Wouldn't that deepen? Wouldn't that aggravate Moses' anger toward them? They knew it all. They'd heard God speak. They had direct revelation. Of all people, they should be clinging to this God, and they've rejected it. How much more so the Israelites, thousands of years later, under Paul, who had seen Jesus walk the earth, had listened to God in the flesh speak, had seen his miracles and experienced it. Of all people, they should embrace him. And they were the ones rejecting him. This heightened the aggravation of Paul. I'm sorry, the anguish of Paul. And I want to apply that to us here today. We have so much. We have so much privilege. Some sitting here have heard hours of gospel preaching. You have a Bible in your lap. You have Christians surrounding you. You realize the privilege you have? The greatest privilege of any to walk this earth for millennia? Yeah, we look at Sodom and Gomorrah and we see their wickedness, don't we? Sodom and Gomorrah did not have a Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah did not know of Christ. We have you probably have six Bibles in your home. You've heard of Jesus your whole life. You've sat under hours of gospel preaching. And to reject Him then? J.C. Ryle says, Nothing offends God so much as the neglect of privileges. Much has been given to us and much will be required. We, like the Israelites, have been given so much. My plea with you who sit here rejecting still is to not reject the privilege. Don't reject the knowledge of Christ. Come to Christ. Receive Him as Lord. But that privilege only served to aggravate Paul's anguish for his lost kinsmen. Consider with me, fifthly, the Christ-likeness of Paul's anguish. You know, the burden that both Moses and Paul felt for the souls of their kinsmen and the desire to see God's name so glorified in the salvation of the wicked is so great that they come closer than any other human example we have to that mind which was in Christ Jesus who gave himself as an offering for sin that others might be saved. Realize what, what I just said? Moses and Paul are two human examples that come closer than any other human examples we have recorded of those whose minds were like Christ who gave himself for the sins of others. Who actually stepped in as the atonement and was cursed. 
that others might be saved. My question for us today, have you felt this burden? Have you felt the anguish for the souls of your lost children, for the souls of your lost family members, the souls of your lost friends, but not only for their souls. My friends, listen, let me ask you this. Have you felt the anguish which Paul felt and Moses felt not only for your mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, but for your enemies. Have you felt great sorrow and unceasing anguish in your heart for those who hate you and would want to destroy you? Christ did. Romans chapter 9, verse 2. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Remember where we began, the Jews who loved Saul but hated Paul and took an oath to murder him. The very vile men who by their hands and by their lips cries killed Jesus and actively hated the apostle. It's for them, Paul says, by unceasing anguish for his enemy. Have you had this burden for the lost? Not only those who treat you well and treat you kindly and treat you fairly, but for those who've taken oaths to kill you. For those who are dead set to destroy you. For the hostile, angry, antagonistic unbeliever. Paul felt that. And why did Paul feel that? Because Paul was so intimately acquainted with his Savior. All Paul was doing was emulating Christ. He was Christ-like. And yet, even in his reflection of Christ, it was only still a slight reflection of Christ's anguish. Listen to the anguish of Christ in Luke twenty-two forty-four, as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And being in an agony... He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Listen to Matthew 26, beginning in verse 37. Jesus, taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was in anguish. Jesus was sorrowful. But there's a difference between the sorrow of Paul, the sorrow of Moses, and the sorrow of Christ. Paul and Moses reflect the sorrow of Christ, but there's a major difference, and it's this. Paul could have wished himself cut off, but Jesus was himself cut off. Jesus Christ did only what the Apostle Paul could wish to be done. Galatians 3.10 for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, 
as it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The anathema which Paul could only slightly wish to be possible, the full weight of God's wrath, was not a faint possibility or a wish of a possibility for Christ. Jesus Christ was locked inside that room with God Almighty. Jesus Christ sat under the full weight of all God's wrath, unmitigated, undivided, undiverted, fully poured out upon him. The winepress of God's wrath fully poured out every drop upon the person of Christ. Anathema, accursed. Remember I said at the start that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He did not merely weep and then pass on and say, to hell with them. He wept. And then he entered the garden of Gethsemane and sweat drops of blood. He wept and then submitted himself to the earthly rulers to be flogged, mocked, beaten. But that was not the agony of that horrible day. The agony atop Golgotha was not the mocking and the scourging and the terrors of mankind. It was the curse Jesus Christ faced from being forsaken by the Father. He bore the curse of the wrath of Almighty God. He actually was accursed. And He did so for you. Moses and Paul caught a glimpse of the burden that would lead one to sacrifice themselves for another. Jesus Christ did not merely catch a glimpse of the agony. He drank it down in full measure. Brothers and sisters, I want us to observe the Christ-likeness of the Apostle Paul. He reflected his Savior. The love he had for the antagonistic, violent people who rejected their Messiah is a reflection of the love Christ had for the world. You know, this is really a mark of true conversion. A burden for the lost. What we see in Moses and in Paul reflecting Christ is really a mark of the state of your soul. Remember Isaiah, upon seeing the Lord in Isaiah 6. He sees his own uncleanness. And immediately he sees the uncleanness of his kinsmen. And he gains a burden for them to take the message of God to them. Have you felt this burden? Have you felt what Paul has felt? If not, why not? It could be perhaps because you've never seen your own need for a Savior. And so there's no desperation that others have such a Savior. Have you ever pressed anyone to believe? Mom, you need the Savior. Well, that's nice for you. Whatever works for you. No, Mom, you need Christ. You need to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Mom, come to Him. Have you felt that anguish? Have you pressed the non-believer to Christ? You know, the more Christ-like we become in our Christian life, the more you're going to be conformed into His image, the more you're going to feel the anguish that Christ felt. Now, I know none of us have a burden For the loss that we ought to have. But it is an unmistakable mark of the new birth. That you do have a desperation for the lost around you. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. There is no better test of our spiritual state and condition than our missionary zeal. Our concern for lost souls. 
That is always the thing that divides people who are just theoretical and intellectual Christians from those who have a living and a vital spiritual life. Why? Because the more Christ-like you become, the more you take on His characteristics and His attributes, and Jesus Christ paid the highest possible price for the lost. Brothers and sisters, we must not be content to hear these words of Paul and let them be for Him only. We must not be eager merely to pass through the first five verses of Romans 9 and get into the juicy stuff on election so we can debate and argue and prove others wrong. We've got to sit and meditate in the anguish of Paul. And ask ourselves, are we likewise burdened for the lost? Does their state of being under the indignation and the wrath of God grieve us? Does it pain us? Does it cause true, deep, genuine sorrow that leads us to bring the gospel to them? You know what's amazing about Paul? He didn't just feel this in his bedroom and go on with his day. In Acts 18, I read it at the start, we have recorded Paul incessantly went to the Jews. It was only after incessantly preaching and they started to gnash their teeth and they were going to destroy him, he says, fine, no more. Your blood be on your own hands, but I'm going to the Gentiles. You know what he's saying in that statement? What's implicit in that statement? If Paul had not shared the gospel with them, some of their blood would have been on his hands. Some of their fate would have been on his hands. But he shared, and he shared, and he shared, and he pressed, and he implored, and he pleaded. And it was only until they finally said, enough, Paul, no more of it, that he said, okay, I move on. I want to lead you, leave you with a story that Charles Spurgeon told. Listen to this. He says, brethren, I want you to feel that you would pass under poverty if you could save souls better by being poor. That you would gladly endure sickness if from your sickbed you could speak better for Christ than now. Aye, and that you would be ready to die if your death might give life to those dear to you. I heard of a dear girl the other day, wrote Spurgeon, who said to her pastor, I could never bring my father to hear you, but I have prayed for him long, and God will answer my request. Now, dear pastor, she said, you will bury me, won't you? My father must come and hear you speak at my grave. Do speak to him. God will bless him. This young girl was dying and she told that to the pastor. Spurgeon goes on to recount the story. He did. The pastor came, spoke at her funeral, and her father was converted. The death of his child brought him to Christ. Oh, to be willing to die if others might be saved from the death eternal. God, give us such a spirit as that. This should be our constant feeling. How else can we become like Christ? Brothers and sisters, look upon the anguish of Paul. But pray, as I pray for myself and as I pray for you, that we, like Christ, would experience and feel this anguish and this sorrow. And that we, like Christ, like Paul, like Moses, would be those who do something about it. Let's pray. Father, please give us a burden for those who know not Christ, that we would be faithful witnesses in this generation of your truth. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.